I've got another patient coming in here in a few minutes, so. Of course, I won't take up much of your time. You're probably already familiar with our drug, MS cotton. Used to treat severe pain, many patients with cancer. MS cotton is a very good drug. So what Purdue did is they took the same system, uh, the cotton system, and they produced uh, opioid for chronic and moderate pain. I would never prescribe a narcotic for moderate pain. There's a pretty long history down here of pill abuse. Less than 1% of people get addicted to Oxycontin. That's not possible. But it is. The FDA actually created a special label to say that it's less addictive than other opioids. Right there. Your most effective talking point is the FDA label. These are your new magic words. Delayed absorption as provided by OxyContin tablets. Delayed absorption as provided by OxyContin tablets is believed to reduce the abuse liability of a drug. I've never seen a label like this on a class two narcotic. It's the first of its kind. Opioid use is being totally redefined in this country. Untreated pain is, a, is an unnecessary evil when you have a non-addictive opioid like OxyContin that can be used to cure everyday suffering. And we're not supposed to hand out samples, but um, it'll be our secret. And I'll leave some coupons with, with Leah so you can uh, redeem for a few more bottles. Trust me, these miners' lives are gonna change overnight when they get a taste of Oxycontin. You're not gonna let your patients suffer when they don't have to, right? Hi, I'm Chasita Giles, a digital strategist at Kaiser Health News, and that was a clip from the new Hulu series, Dope Sick. I'm sitting here with Danny Strong, executive producer of the series, Beth Macy, author of the best-selling book the show is based on, Aniri Patani, KHN correspondent who has reported on opioid policy, substance use, and mental health, and Nirmita Panchal, KFF senior policy analyst whose work focuses on mental health and substance use. So let's jump right in. How did writers work with journalists to put this script together? Like, how did, how did you guys collaborate to get to the final product? Um, I, we had a wonderful collaboration. I mean, Beth is an incredible journalist. She wrote a magnificent book. She's also a really lovely person. Mm -hmm. And it was, you know, she was in the writer's room full time on the show. And so we had, uh, we had a resident expert in the room. And then I think that what was unique about my collaboration with Beth is that the journalism side of the process never ended. We kept doing interviews. It, it, it was as if it was an ongoing investigation all the way till uh, we wrapped production. Mm -hmm. So we would do interviews together. People would leak documents to us. We would do interviews separately and come back together. So it was this unusual process in which it was we were writing a scripted drama and then simultaneously uh, doing you know active active investigative journalism uh, simultaneously. And new doc new documents were coming out all the time in the legal filings from the Massachusetts and New York case. So we would, the whole room would like, we'd take turns, I'll go through this, you go through this, and then we would all report back to Danny and kind of decide what the, the best highlights were. And it was just, I mean, we had hoped, when we first started, we were like, we really hope we could get this one memo, you mm -hmm. know, and. Um, which we didn't get. Which but, we but did we got, not but we, get. We got a Justice Department memo that was the summation of the memo, mm -hmm. which was pretty good, you know, that was that And was led a to big, a couple of amazing scoops. Amazing, amazing scoops uh, that, that we got from that Justice Department memo. And how did you build the characters? Because in the book, the characters aren't exactly as they are in the book, they're kind of like, manifestations of, of a, a few things, or you, you explain it. Yeah, so I was kind of surprised. Um, Danny already had the outline for the, the major characters in the book. A couple of the ones in the last couple of episodes are directly from my book, but the victim profiles, the Michael Keaton character, the, um, the Caitlin Deaver character, who is, who is the coal miner, um, those were amalgamations that Danny created based on research he had done, and then we put heads together. We ended up bringing in an amazing uh, resource who, who was a physician in uh, Tennessee named Dr. Steve Lloyd, and he sat in the writing room with us, and he was somebody that has 
every element of uh, experience with addiction that you can think of, and including he was a past Tennessee drug czar. So we were able to get all kinds of stuff from him. And like, like Danny said, we just kept reporting. Yeah, it was important to me uh, when I, when you know, there's so much research out there, there's so many books written on the, the opioid crisis. I think Beth's book is the strongest as far as covering people on the ground and telling you know the stories of the victims. And there are so many stories. Um, and I thought if we were to just tell this story with, with one person's life events, um, it wouldn't be, it would be, I thought more interesting if we could do composite characters and get life events from as many people as we want. And in doing that, we were able to get so many more stories in of what people went through. And I thought that could create an almost a grander universal truth of the crisis than if you were sort of confined with one person's mm -hmm. uh, life events. So, so it was a decision I made early on, and and I think it was I, I think it turned out well, you know. And, and Beth embraced it immediately when she came on board. She thought that that was a great idea, and uh, and I think it, it worked quite well. So that brings me to because I watched all seven episodes, and I, and especially the Richard Sackler character, I was wondering like which parts are fictional and which are fact. Like, and how did did you have someone fact check the script? I assume since you were in the writers' room, you did some fact checking, probably. Or, yeah, I did some. We had um, Ben Rubin, who was the staff writer. He did a lot of that. It was heavily legal reviewed and fact checked by the lawyers at Disney. Fine tooth comb. Yep. Yeah, yeah. And we had um, Gerald Posner, who wrote Pharma, was a consultant for us. Andrew Kolodny was a consultant for us. So we had a, we had a, a, a wide swath of, of experts mm -hmm. on it, you know, as far as uh, the show is a dramatization. Mm -hmm. It's as Aaron Sorkin, who's sort of the king of nonfiction movies. Uh, I, I love this phrase he uses. It's a, it's a painting, not a photograph, mm -hmm. right? So did, uh, did the Sackler say every word? that we portray in the show? No, obviously not. That, that, that account doesn't exist. They wouldn't even know, right? Well, who said every word, what, where, and when? The question is, does it, is, it, um, is the foundation of it truthful? Does it represent the truth? And there's a technique I use in these nonfiction scripted dramas, which is I'll create fictional scenes as a conduit to get true facts out. Mm -hmm. so, so sure, that meeting didn't happen, but everything they're saying in it is true information. Did directly they, from the documents. Directly from the documents. Did they say it that way? No. Now, in some cases, uh, I would take emails that either came out in discovery or were leaked to us and create a scene that is verbatim their email exchange. Wow. Right? So, and those are some of the more damning scenes are literally just verbatim from their emails to each other. And Beth, did you have any veto power on anything? That's a better question for Danny. Did Beth have veto power? <laughs> I'm going to answer the question I, I wished you would have asked. No, I'm just <laughs> kidding. I, there were two things I really wanted to happen by the end of the show, and Danny was totally open to them. Once I brought him up to board with my research, because I, I was still reporting on a second book by the time uh, the writing room got together, I didn't want us to stereotype Appalachia, and I don't think we do. I think people will be proud of their stories because they are, they are perceived as not just victims, but people who are fighting back from oppression, from a century of oppression. And then the other thing is we have a really strong storyline about medication-assisted treatment, um, which at the at the beginning, I think maybe the first time I mentioned it, you thought was a little wonky, because it no, is no, no, a little it was in the weeds. important to me. It was, there, there was a certain elements of it that I was like, well, that might be tricky to dramatize, but the story overall, I absolutely wanted to end the show with that, with those concepts. Right, and, yeah. and including this massive division, as you guys know, between abstinence only, which grows out of the fact that addiction was always the stepchild in healthcare, and what science says is the gold standard of care for opioid use disorder, which is buprenorphine and methadone. So you see people being stigmatized at 12-step meetings. You see all different kinds of rehab, many of which aren't working which we know American families are remortgaging their houses to do exactly what science says you shouldn't do. And so I think by the end, like you can read all that and all the, all the uh, articles and books, but to see it play out in, in drama, you really, it makes it understandable. Yeah, I think it's actually one of the most important things the show does mm -hmm. is, is it shows these therapies uh, in a positive light. They're controversial and stigmatized and, 
and you know it's like it's like having insulin stigmatized right I, I, they should not be stigmatized and uh, and I think that this show could hopefully move the needle on that even if say twice as many people that need these uh, treatments go on them it'll be such a huge wonderful victory but but maybe we can move the needle even further on it and so the opioid crisis was declared a public health emergency in 2017 so why is now the time for a show like this and that's something all of you could speak to if you'd like. Do you, do you two want to? Yeah, tell us what you're seeing on the ground. The, a lot of the show takes place in the early 2000s and we see this growing, but this is still very large, very urgent public health crisis right now. Uh, last year, 2020, saw the highest number of overdose deaths on record with 93,000 people dying. So it's certainly just as much of an issue now as it was then, if not more. And some of that has to do with the pandemic, but some people are saying, you know, public health experts I've spoken to that the deaths were going up in early 2020 before COVID hit as well. Um, so we can't say, you know, this was a blip. This is something that's continuing to be a problem. And some of the differences from, you know, maybe what we might see in the show in the early ages of the epidemic is that now a lot of the overdose deaths are coming from synthetic opioids like fentanyl as opposed to prescription opioids, that sort of transition. And we're also seeing it affecting all the states and a lot more people. It's kind of maybe started off in these select communities, but it has spread out. And we're seeing racial impacts too with uh, black Americans seeing one of the fastest uh, growing rates of overdose deaths. So it's just impacting more and more people. Yeah, we have an 88% treatment gap right now. Um, at, the, at the time of the public health uh, declaration emergency, uh, it was 90, so then, you know, the government puts in these billions and a lot of it never made it to the ground. A third of it didn't even get spent, so we've got a real infrastructure problem. Um, and I, I know you're probably a, a better expert at kind of where the gaps are, but we need to really move that treatment gap, I think. Yeah, yeah, uh, we're definitely seeing a number of gaps and also to, to touch on what Aneri was saying about what we're seeing in 2020 during the pandemic, um, we're seeing a number of things that consequences of the pandemic have actually exacerbated the drug epidemic itself. Um, so for example, we had an economic recession where millions of people lost their jobs and also many people are reporting poor mental health. So prior to the pandemic, there were about one in 10 people who were experiencing anxiety and depression, fast forward to now, that has significantly increased to one in three people. And when we take all of this into account, the job loss, uh, financial hardship, poor mental health, these are things that can often go hand in hand with substance use. Um, and then another thing we're seeing is a disruption in substance use treatment on top of uh, barriers that already existed. So for some treatment facilities, that means suspending services, and for others, that may have meant closing entirely during the pandemic. Uh, there's also some research showing that the medications used to treat opioid overdose, like buprenorphine, and the medications to reverse uh, drug overdoses, like naloxone, are actually being filled at lower levels than prior to the pandemic. Um, and then as Aneri mentioned, we're continuing to see uh, widespread fentanyl-related deaths. So when we see these numbers of over 90,000 drug overdose deaths in, in just 2020, these consequences of the pandemic, including job loss, poor mental health, access to care issues, and fentanyl being widespread, they really speak to the numbers that we're seeing. Mm -hmm. And why do you think small rural towns like the one depicted in the series are so vulnerable to crises like this? Mm. Well, because Purdue Pharma uh, directly targeted those towns because they bought the data set uh, from IMS Health, which we dramatize in the show, telling them which doctors in the nation were already prescribing the most competing opioids. And then they sent their reps out armed with that data along with psychological profiles and uh, with this notion that, look, we have this new drug that's better than Hercocet, Vicodin, um, and the FDA allows us to say it's virtually non-addictive. 
And they picked those areas because they had higher painkiller prescribing rates already because they were areas where uh, there were a lot of workplace injuries, mining, farming, logging, rural Maine, Appalachia. And the really, just the saddest, most tragic part of this to me is that it was the same time a lot of the jobs were going away. So yeah, sure, there were maybe more people there with uh, workplace injuries, but there were also really desperate people. And when we're desperate, um, you know, there were survivors. And so a lot of folks, in addition to taking them and becoming dependent on them, they also saw the prescriptions as a way to, as a side hustle, as a way to make money to pay their other bills because they had lost their jobs. And, and then for Richard Sacco to just blame that on them. Yeah, he addicts them and then he blames them for their addiction. Mm -hmm. uh, there's also another element that shows how effective Purdue's marketing campaign was, mm -hmm. which was that there were five states that had triplicate prescribing systems where a doctor would have to fill out three different forms to prescribe narcotic painkillers. So prescribing in those five states um, was just way less than, than the other 45 states. So Purdue didn't target those states from 96 to 2007 or 8 until most of these states got rid of those triplicate prescribing um, um, regulations. And those five states had way less rise in addiction overdose rates as the other 45 states, which is essentially proof positive that Purdue's marketing techniques uh, had this drastic effect and that even after- Even now. Yeah, even now, even after the triplicate uh, uh, regulations went away, those states were still spared. Those, their, their overdose rates and, and addiction rates haven't significantly gone up post that, which shows how powerful that nine year period was in which Purdue was heavily marketing the other 45 states. So I wanna go back to treatment. So in the show, we kind of see how difficult it can be to treat opioid use disorder and the different kinds of treatment that the characters try. So can we talk a little bit about how easy is it to access treatment if you are a victim of opioid use disorder? Sure. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I have a new book I just finished last mm -hmm. Friday. I mean, not finished, turned in last Friday that's about a lot of these, um, these gaps in care. And um, we know that people who take buprenorphine die at rates far less. Uh, we're talking 60 to 80 percent uh, less likely to overdose and die. And yet only one out of five people has access to that. And I'm stunned by the fact that there are fewer prescriptions. I'm sure it's because of the economy, right? And less access and um, that's really disturbing. So we really need to work on closing that treatment gap. And the other thing is um, so many families that I've met have, have just moved mountains to send their kids to, to rehabs, abstinence only rehabs, which is still most rehabs in America are abstinence only. I mean, there's hardly any regulation about rehabs. Uh, ASAM says only one in five people with uh, uh, OUD even need rehab. Like mostly they can be treated outpatient with BUP and, and counseling and social support. Social support's often very lacking. But um, you see so many people just um, uh, losing everything because they think if they spend a lot of money to send their kid to some abstinence only rehab in Arizona or Las Vegas, that it's gonna work and, and it doesn't. And then they get out of rehab and they are what's called opioid naive. And then when they use again, that's when they're the most likely to die. And it, in my book, Dope Sick, I tell the story of a young former honor student who gets addicted by prescription and then moves to heroin and is sent out to um, a re abstinence only rehab in Las Vegas. And then when she bombs out of that, which she had done previously, um, she's then on the streets and doing sex work and um, working in and out of criminal gangs. And she, her, her body is found in the bottom of a dumpster on Christmas Eve in 2017. Her murder remains unsolved. But the, the thing I want to tell everybody is that the first time I met her in 2015, I was just starting Dope Sick and I said, what do you, how did you get addicted? And she tells me, you know, she was overprescribed in an urgent care. And that what I wish I would have known is like, she knew what she needed. 
She said, we need urgent care for the addicted. We need places where people like me can go and not be judged, not be turned away, because there's all these uh, rigid rules. You know, you have to go to counseling three times a week, nine hours a week, all this stuff to get, we make them go through too many hoops. And by the time they're homeless, uh, they don't have IDs, they need walk-in clinics where they can just go for treatment. Otherwise, we're gonna have, we already have skyrocketing hepatitis C, but we're already seeing in places like Charleston, West Virginia, which just outlawed needle exchange, skyrocketing HIV outbreak. And, um, and our politics in this country have just gotten so rabid. And, um, you know, they're still blaming, they're still following Richard Sackler's playbook and they're blaming the abusers. Well, when you talk about politics, and, and this is, sorry if I'm gonna ask them a question, but I, I, I just feel like politics is a potential way out of this situation. That it seems to me that there's good politics in a bipartisan way for federal intervention, federal treatment programs, federal dollars into these states uh, that could help supply treatment to the people that need them. And you've got states, red and blue states, that are suffering from this problem. And it's a devastating problem to many of them. And I just think there could be, you know, uh, a humanitarian win, a way to move the needle on this with federal government intervention, but that it's also a political win as well. Uh, because of the situation of, of the crisis, you know, some, spares, no one. spares no one. So, so I, I, you know, is it, why isn't there more appetite for federal intervention for at least, you know, trying to cut prices for Suboxone treatment or these walk-in clinics that, to me, I, I hadn't heard that from you before. I'm like, well, that's a great idea, <laughs> right? You know, what, you what is there? Yeah, I can't wait. I was going to um, say, I don't think that it's, uh, I don't think there's anyone on either side of the aisle who's saying we don't want to help, right? Everyone yeah. is in a, um, representing a district that has con constituents affected by this. So I haven't talked to a politician who says we don't need to address opioid epidemic, but I think they all disagree on how. And it gets to some of the divisions you're talking about, right? Who um, favors uh, medication-assisted treatment, who favors your traditional rehab and- Or the, lock the, them up. And yeah, or But, or but, but I think what, what Beth talks about yeah. is, is, is that lock them up in traditional is not working for opioid use disorder. Mm -hmm. You know, that that's, that's pretty cut and dry at this point. So why not have federal intervention, federal dollars to help on the medical treatment side mm -hmm. for those that can want it? And we're just hoping that the show can, can move the needle on acceptance of it um, and that that could potentially snowball. Yeah, I mean, certainly I know uh, I was previously reporting in Pennsylvania specifically and there it, it's still very divided politically and you know the traditional rehab providers have strong lobbies too. There you oh, go. Sure, so, sure. The answer, yeah. and, the, and the sheriffs, especially in places like you and I report on rural North Carolina, um, they've got to get reelected and a lot of that reelection happens by we're tough on crime, you know, if we have MAT treatment in our jail or we divert them uh, from jail into treatment. I mean, it's a real, it's moving that Overton window that, that Rosario was talking about last night. It's a real, it's get, we need a real shift to happen for people to understand that, uh, you know, the police don't have to emasculate themselves. It, it's a way when they start doing it, like Fairfax County Jail is doing BUP counseling. CSB workers located inside the jail, picking people up when they get out, taking them to their next spot, helping them with social supports. And why every sheriff in America doesn't want to do that? Because once they start doing it, they see they're not seeing the same people come back all the time. And it's just like with um, doctors in the EDs who prescribe buprenorphine, which, oh my gosh, nobody wants to, we don't do that, that's not in our purview. But once they start doing it and they see results, then they become evangelists. And that's what frustrates me that the law enforcement side hasn't quite gotten there yet. But that's also another argument of what you two are talking about for federal dollars instead of state dollars, because there's a lot more internal politics for state dollars with these exact issues you're talking about. But it seems to me federal uh, intervention on a national basis could supersede and just bypass the issues of the sheriff and the local Using rehab Using the facilities. power of the purse. Yeah, exactly. I Using feel like the that's the hope for a lot of health care, but our system is so fragmented it becomes difficult to do, right? Federal dollars are trickled down. The way they get implemented on the ground is often through state, and then even state funds them to counties to do, you know, 
you know how to treat the people in your area best, and there, there's some merit to that, but a lot of it is, you know, it, <laughs> it's really hard it's to make working. it, it's really yeah. hard to make it, uh, you know, systemized across the whole country, but I think a lot of people have that same hope that you just uh, mm -hmm. verbalized. Thank you. But A shares are rightfully concerned that if Oxycontin doesn't sell, or if it runs afoul of the FDA, or if insurance companies stop covering it for whatever reason, it could literally sink this entire company. Richard, I respect how hard you work, I really do, but this family has had a successful company for 40 years and now it's at risk. You vastly overspent, and it's not unreasonable that we would be upset and anxious. It'll work. I promise you. Thank you. Tell my nephew it's fucking better. So in this show, we see how much um, the Sacklers incentivize uh, misleading information and how much, like you were saying with the marketing, how much marketing they did. And in the present day, we see Purdue taking the court and a settlement's reached. So um, I guess, Aniri, if you could answer, what does that settlement money do for people who are already addicted? So a lot of that is still up in the air and being decided, but there are, as I you know, speak to advocates, families, public health experts, all the people who are trying to influence where that money goes, there's a lot of different buckets. So one bucket is kind of your prevention side. Can we invest in communities that are at risk, in youth, um, their academic and economic success that kind of helps them stay away from uh, you know, using this as their only economic means to, to make money or otherwise? Um, the other one is treatment bucket, right? And there you end up, um, you know, does the money go towards the rehabs? Does it go towards medication? Um, and that, that's a divide there. Uh, another bucket is uh, diversion from criminal justice. So instead of locking these folks up, can we uh, funnel them towards treatment or things that might be more helpful? And then uh, there are also direct payments to families who have lost loved ones to opioid overdoses or to families who have kids with neonatal abstinence syndrome. So I think it's still being worked out where it's going to go, but there are a lot of places that it could, it could go to hopefully help the people affected by the epidemic. Only about half of the states have, have done legislation to make sure that the money gets spent correctly. So I'm hoping that will increase soon. Now, in this show, Dr. Samuel Phoenix is just the one doctor for this whole entire rural town. So, Nermita, if I could ask you, how could telehealth help in towns that are set up similar to this? As you said, the show touches on the scarcity of providers in these rural towns. Um, and so it makes for a lot of people with mental health and substance use issues, it's challenging for them to get access to care. And the role that telehealth could play is linking these patients into care that they normally would have to potentially drive so far to. Um, and another thing is that what we see in rural towns is they there are disparities between the type of care we're seeing in rural towns versus urban towns, where rural towns are not taking up on medication-assisted treatment um, in the same way that urban areas are. So if we're able to link patients in rural areas to you know, providers from urban areas that are more equipped to administer medication-assisted treatment, um, that could also make, an, make a difference. Uh, as we know, during the pandemic, there's been a huge uptick in telehealth, um, and some recent data showing that it is starting to taper off for physical health care, but it's still holding strong for mental health and substance use treatment. Um, so that could be a promising sign of what that means, especially for towns like the one um, in the show. There's also still some barriers to consider with telemedicine, for example, um, internet access, and patients who prefer to be in person 
um, possibly privacy concerns, and of course, cost. How does health insurance play into all of that or lack thereof? Yeah, I'm so glad you asked that. I think in most of my reporting, and I'm curious if, it, if you found similarly, Beth, insurance is one of the number one barriers that comes up in terms of you know why people aren't able or aren't willing to get care um, you know even when we're talking about the rehab stays that you know a lot of people are opting for um, some don't accept any insurance the ones that do then you get into most insurances are going to cover 14 days maybe 28 days if you're lucky um, and a lot of them also have a cap you can go to rehab two times we'll fund it and that's it but addiction is a chronic disease, and so a lot of people have to go multiple times before they're gonna be in long-term rehab, or they have to try medication and a rehab, or different things, and if your insurance maxes out at a certain point, then it becomes, how do I even try treatment again, even if I want to? Um, and I think I've done some reporting in uh, North Carolina and South Carolina, which are both states that have not expanded Medicaid yet, and there are a lot of people who are falling into that gap and don't have insurance. Um, so one story that really you know, sticks with me is there's a family in South Carolina, um, they went to the ER uh, when uh, the son was in withdrawal from opioid use and he wanted to get care and the hospital essentially said, you know, we need to admit you if you want any kind of long-term care. And he said, I don't have insurance, I can't afford an inpatient hospital stay. And so the family left, they couldn't afford it. Um, they wanted to try medication, but that's really expensive too. He didn't have insurance to cover that. And um, a few months later, he ended up passing away of an overdose. Mm -hmm. So insurance and cost is kind of the number one thing that I come across in talking to families. The Medicaid expansion and Obamacare has been the number one tool for turning back the crisis. The little teeny bit that we have has been largely because of that. I think the, the studies bear that out. And I've been doing a lot of reporting in North Carolina too, and the biggest barrier is still lack of insurance. I wondered, in the show, it doesn't get into health insurance at all. And as you can see, like it's a very complicated topic. So is that, did that go into your decision not to get into health insurance within the scripts? Well, ultimately our goal was to show a path forward, you know, and that that path forward has a lot of complications to it and a lot of different avenues. But because that path forward is so stigmatized right now, um, I think partly we didn't want to undercut it <laughs> with some of the complications that go into it. Uh, and we just wanted to show that here is a medication uh, that you can get over the, that's a, that's a prescription that you don't have to go to a clinic every day, although methadone's also very effective as well, um, that could change your life and get you on, on a path forward. And so, you know, that was our that was our primary goal. And then simultaneously, you know, that's why we have a whole rehab episode mm -hmm. in which we see two different characters go. One goes into sort of a higher higher end rehab facility. One goes more of a religious rehab route, which felt very authentic to the region. And you see in both cases, um, it just doesn't work. It, it, it doesn't work for opioid use disorder. So it was that was part of the larger goal of what we were trying to do. Mm -hmm. Uh, was to just, uh, once again, sh show a path forward. Is the opioid crisis getting a different treatment from Hollywood now? And I asked that question thinking about the crack epidemic. And when we see shows that depict the crack epidemic, it usually focuses on law enforcement and criminals and the people that are victims of the crack epidemic are painted as, not as victims, but as criminals. Mm -hmm. Whereas this show is very different in its depiction of this town, these people are all victims and they're very sympathetic characters. So are we seeing a different treatment by Hollywood of the opioid crisis? Well, I'm, I don't know what Hollywood's up to, you know, <laughs> as far as in sort of a macro sense. I just know that when I first came to this subject matter and this story, uh, there was a criminal organization run by a family mm -hmm. and their crimes were unbelievably outrageous, devious, manipulative and far worse than, than my perception of them before I started researching it. Then simultaneously, there were uh, very, very clear-cut victims. And so my original goal before Beth came on board was to dramatize all this, was to, it was to create a clear record of what Purdue Pharma did. Mm -hmm. Also at the time, I saw the show because uh, OxyContin prescribing had started to come down because it had become so you know, well known at that point, but they were using their same dishonest techniques mm -hmm. all over the world now. So part of what I, I wanted to do was to send a warning to the world that Purdue Pharma and the Sacklers are coming to addict you. Mm -hmm. so, so that was part of it, but the other part was 
to show the victims and to hopefully redefine uh, the stereotype of addiction, which is what Beth did so beautifully in her book, which is why I embraced her when when it was you know when we were asked to, to team up because that seems to be not just a, something that could be so incredible for people that suffer from addiction that may not completely understand that their brain chemistry has been altered, mm -hmm. um, but for loved ones, friends, uh, and that by having a new understanding of what is actually happening on a scientific level, it could A, create much more compassion, mm -hmm. you know, and then, and then hopefully a much better understanding of how to potentially solve the problem. So th those were my goals, um, and, and, and it had nothing to do with what anyone else in Hollywood was up to. Mm -hmm. I think it does a very good job of doing that. Like, I, I really got into the characters. I really was rooting for them. I don't want to give anything away, but it definitely, I think you achieved what you were trying to do. Oh, that's great to hear. Mm -hmm. and, and you haven't seen the last one yet, which really which nails is, home. It's the best. Oh, yeah, it really nails home everything that, that I'm talking about here, because it's, yeah. that's the end. That's the final episode. So I wanted to really make crystal clear the mm -hmm. themes and ideas that the whole piece was trying to achieve. Yeah. Did you want to add anything to that question? Do you think the opioid crisis versus the crack epidemic, it's, it's kind of being, it's a different lens that we're looking at it through? It is a different lens, and it's absolutely wrong that the crack epidemic didn't get the kind of coverage that it deserved. And America was looking at the crack epidemic through a war on drugs that was really a war on people, uh, mostly black and brown people, right? And so now, you know, some some people have said because of uh, opioid use disorder affecting at the beginning largely white areas, although they are more diverse than, than just that, um, now all of a sudden everybody cares about it. But I think where we're gonna go forward, and you guys might wanna chime in on this, is as we get, begin to see uh, a shift from criminal justice to treating people as patients worthy of medical care, it's going to involve dismantling the war on drugs, and that's going to be really hard on law enforcement, and there's going to be a lot of pushback. And what we're seeing right now is like, it's like the wall coming down, and the bricks are falling on our heads, mm -hmm. you know? And, but ultimately, if we can look at places like Oregon, which decriminalized all drugs and then put the money they were spending into social supports, walk-in clinics, better access to BUP, um, that's helping all families, black, brown, white families, and it's gonna, it's gonna be um, just a much better, but it's gonna be a lot of, um, a lot of pain getting there. I'll just add to that quickly. I think, um, just as Beth said, you know, the treatment of the opioid crisis is more as a public health crisis. Um, and as you said, the crack epidemic is often treated as criminal justice. And I think that has, you know, of course, so much to do with the racial history of our country. And even within the opioid epidemic, right, where a lot of it, there is a push to look at it as public health and recognize that the people suffering from this are suffering from a disease and they are victims of, you know, a company and marketing and all these other issues. But I think we still see racial disparities within that. When you talk about access to um, even the medications, right, a lot of, um, there are reports that a lot of uh, black and brown communities really only have access to methadone, which requires you to go every day to a clinic early in the morning, highly stigmatizing. It's not as easy to maintain with a job versus um, buprenorphine is more easily accessible for white communities, which means you can get a 30-day prescription and take it at your home. You could go get it at your primary care doctor's office. So even within the current um, epidemic, there are still a lot of racial gaps. And, and what you just described, it, it's profound, the difference between having to go somewhere at seven in the morning and having a, a, a prescription at home that you can just take at any point in the day. I mean, it's, it's the, the lifestyle shift of, of that, just how it affects your work, your life, every element of it is, is so significant. Uh, so, so hearing this is really disheartening, and, and I do think that that's, it's just an area that we've got to find inroads. Yeah, and I think also adding to um, the conversation about racial disparities is that we are really starting to see a shift where, you know, around five years ago, uh, communities of color were accounting for about 20% of drug overdose deaths. And last year in 2020, um, they now accounted for around 30% of drug overdose deaths. And of course, as we've been discussing, this is happening while we know that 
black and brown communities don't have the same access. And even on top of that, black and brown um, communities that are making it into treatment, they are often not completing treatment. This has been a really great conversation. Are there any kind of last things you want to tell people about the show or about like what you were trying to achieve with the show? I think you summed it up really good. The nicest thing anybody ever said about the book, and I think it, it will be said about the show, is that this is a person in recovery that came up to me after a talk I gave, and she said, until I read your book, I didn't understand that I was part of a bigger story. I thought I was just a really bad person. And so I think if that can be the takeaway, that we can, it's almost cliche to say stigma is the biggest problem, but it really is because all of the systemic issues that we've been talking today come from stigma on a personal level, but also on a government level, on a federal level. Um, it really is the answer to, to, to shifting that window. Thank you guys so much. And I hope you guys are able to catch the show on Hulu. It premieres on October 13th. And um, yeah, thank you so much. Thank you for having us. Yeah, appreciate it. Thank you.